Well, OK, the bar at the bottom there is still showing, but I think we're just going to roll with it. Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Richard Otis. Uh, as, our, as our moderator said, I'm a PhD candidate at Penn State. I'm a material scientist, and I work extensively with Python. Uh, Zikwe Lu is a professor at Penn State. He's my advisor. And uh, this work is uh, sponsored uh, under a NASA Space Technology Research Fellowship. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what uh, the CalFAD method is, because the package is named PyCalFAD, so you should probably know what CalFAD is. And uh, CalFAD is a uh, very contrived acronym for the calculation of phase diagrams. Um, but it's more than just the calculation of phase diagrams. Uh, it has to do with describing the thermodynamic properties of any material by uh, constructing models for the energies of phases that are in the system but not just the stable phases that are in the system, but also possible phases that are in the system. So um, what we usually refer to them as metastable phases. So we construct parametrized models for the phases that exist in those systems. And then once we have those models, yes, we can calculate the phase diagram, but we can also compute all sorts of thermodynamic properties of, uh, in the case of my research, alloy systems. And uh, we can do that. Uh, by considering both equilibrium and non-equilibrium uh, properties of those materials. And here I've listed a little bit about the, uh, the mathematical model behind these, as well as a depiction of uh, the energy surface of a three-component material and how it relates to uh, mapping on the phase diagram here. And this, uh, this, uh, this method, this CalFAD method, has been around essentially since we've had ubiquitous uh, computing. It was uh, Pioneered, it was pioneered by, uh, by Larry Kaufman in the, in the 70s, and uh, it's essentially been going on and uh, continuing apace uh, ever since then. But um, so the CalFAD, the CalFAD community right now is facing uh, a lot of challenges, and uh, I would say probably the most significant challenges have to do with data. And uh, number one challenge is uh, data fragmentation. And uh, that has to do with this, this workflow here that's kind of, that I've depicted on the, uh, the right-hand side here. Uh, and it has to do with the problem that we need experimental data for our models. So our models are fit to experimental data or from first principles data computed from quantum mechanics. Um, they exist in disparate sources, disparate formats all over the literature. So that means anytime you want to you want to develop one of these models, you have to do exhaustive searches. There's no there's no clearinghouse for this data. There's no, uh, as I mentioned, the second point. There's no standards for the data, so you don't know exactly what you're going to get. Um, but moreover, once you've gathered the data, um, you have to go through this process to actually get it into a format that you can use to fit your models. Um, and then also you iteratively try to figure out what are the best parameters for the model. It's not all automated. There is some um, uh, subject matter expertise that has to go into what reasonable parameters are. Um, and while you do that, you see these gray boxes. They depict the fact that you lose history, you lose metadata all through this entire process. And then finally, you publish these parameters. Um, a lot of times as a text table, sometimes if you're lucky, they publish it in a, a, a format called TDB, which you can download digitally. Um, and then once again, it's uh, fragmented because it goes into disparate sources. And so this is how CalFed, this is how the computational thermodynamics community has disseminated um, its, uh, its information now for the past uh, several decades um, without really a lack of good workflow tools. Um, fourth is uh, uncertainty quantification. I didn't mention anything at all about putting error bars on any of the data points or any of the models here that I've mentioned. Um, that's a significant concern. And, all of this links down to this question of reproducibility of your, uh, of your models. And reproducibility is important not just from a scientific standpoint, right? Like in principle, every scientific analysis, especially computational ones because it's so easy, ought to be you know, as close to perfectly reproducible as possible. But there's also a practical reason why we care about this in the CalFAD community. And it has to do um, with, with this problem, the problem of maintaining CalFAD databases. So here I'm depicting a hypothetical six-component system, A, B, C, D, E, F. You could imagine this as elements on the periodic table, so like um, nickel, iron, cobalt, chromium, uh, and so on. And so the way CalFAD databases are built up is they're built um, starting from the pure elements. So 
uh, in our community, we have a, an agreed upon uh, uh, standard for all the peer elements. And uh, we, we fit the binary system, so we, we add in parameters that describe binary interactions between the components. And then uh, finally ternaries to describe ternary interactions between components. Thankfully, nature cut us a break. We don't have to go up to higher order. We can do linear combinations of the ternaries, and that basically has you covered for metallurgy. Um, so I would say in the community right now, most of the binary systems are done. There's pretty good descriptions. Ternary is sparse, but a lot of the important ternaries are done. Um, but the challenge here is, what happens if you decide to change an important binary? Say, if you're a nickel-based superalloy person, aluminum-nickel is one of the most important uh, binary systems. Let's say you want to make a change to aluminum-nickel. This also isn't hypothetical. This is something we're discussing, right, we're discussing in the community. You want to make a change to aluminum-nickel. That means every, every system that contains aluminum-nickel up above and you have to consider we go to higher order, seven, eight, nine, ten component systems, uh, you have to modify all of the, uh, all of the upstream systems. Uh, or what if you want to make a change to uh, the, one of the pure elements? So this is something that we're talking about right now. Uh, we've recently, uh, in the community, developed new uh, stabilities for all the pure elements. They're to get the low temperature, like going down to zero Kelvin, uh, get those properties better correct, more correct. Um, but that committee actually hasn't released their results. And the reason is because uh, they're afraid of fragmenting the community even further by basically having people fit to two different standards. And so this is an example where our data management practices are actually holding our field back because we can't move on to the next uh, evolution because we have all this legacy data that we have to manage. And so um, this is a significant enough problem my, uh, my advisor uh, co-wrote a paper with some, uh, with some scientists from NIST talking about this problem and about how we can uh, further improve our, our infrastructure and what are the needs for our infrastructure and how do we make it better. And um, the key takeaway I think we took from this was we wanted to be able to make PyCalFAD, this tool I'm talking about today, a key part of that um, in terms of building on top of new, more open infrastructure uh, that also can leverage all the great technologies that have been developed across the scientific Python community. So our, our, our goal for PyCalFAD is we're developing these open source, uh, permissively open source licensed implementations of all the core routines for CalFAD, you know, including phase diagrams, property diagrams, um, also solving the inverse problem. So if I know kind of what my phase diagram looks like and I know something about the thermodynamic properties of a material, can I fit a model? Right? So a lot, of, a lot of this is, I have a model, I want to calculate the diagram, but we also want to be able to go the other way. Um, and then this is specifically dealing with multi-component and multi-phase alloy systems. So I'm a metallurgist, so I mainly focus on alloys, though there's nothing that precludes you from being able to apply something like this to a ceramic system or even a polymeric system. So the key steps when you want to compute a phase diagram are you have to sample the energy uh, in this case, the Gibbs energy and composition space. You need to determine, then you need to determine the phase relations at all those compositions, um, <coughs> which is equivalent to minimizing the energy under the constraints. And then the third step is you draw the diagram. So um, the first challenge you run into when you want to sample composition space is um, compositions are like fractional quantities, which means they have to add up to one. And it can be kind of tricky when you, try to, when you want to figure out a reliable and consistent way to sample a space that's constrained. And um, so you can see this example here on the left-hand side. So imagine we have um, a three-component system, so y1, y2, and y3 is equal to 1 minus the sum of y1 and y2, right? So that means that this white triangle here, um, which I call the Gib, which is called the Gibbs simplex, is the feasible region, whereas if you go out here, uh, stuff starts summing up to be uh, more than one, which means you get negative fractions, so it's not feasible. So we really, we want to sample this triangle here uniformly. Um, and we also need to be able to do that in an arbitrary number of dimensions. So um, the solution that, uh, that I developed uh, was to use uh, something called a Halton sequence, which I'll describe a little bit more. Um, it's really nice because it's, like it's like a uniform random sequence, except it's deterministic. It's the same every time. But 
mathematicians have proven that uh, if you add enough points, the Halton sequence will behave uniformly. Thank you. And so it uh, has this uh, uniform random sample. It's fully deterministic, and it uses prime numbers. Um, you can read more about it on Wikipedia. And so we have this uh, convex hull method, which uh, is what we use uh, in PyCalFed 1. I just finished on the plane a new version, PyCalFed 2, which uh, improves over a uh, over a quick hull, because of the nature of the problem, we can get slightly better performance. And it's the idea that we map this uh, triangulation of the surface, and it maps directly to the phase diagram. And so um, PyCalFed had its first public release in April. It's right now about 5,000, 6,000 lines of code. There's been 800 commits. And uh, it works well in the notebook. That's how I like to use it. And you can find, uh, you can find it on GitHub. The core architecture uses PyParsing to read in TDB files. We have a plan to eventually build a REST API. Um, it feeds into a model object using SymPy, and uh, then using LambdaFy, it's converted to um, more efficient uh, representation. And then we use uh, NumPy and also a package called X-Ray, which is awesome, by the way. I don't know if you guys are familiar with X-Ray or not, but it's a tool for uh, labeling the axes of uh, NumPy arrays, so you can do operations with labels, which is really nice. And then finally, you get plotting in the user output. Um, and so if I want to fit data to a model, then what we can do is, uh, so this is a work in progress, and if you're interested, you can track the fitting branch on my Git re repo. So if you want to do the fitting, which is an, uh, kind of the inverse problem, uh, we have this, this idea where we use this fit model function, and so the idea is you take the result from fit model, you plug it into this keyword argument, you get a dictionary of models, those models then plug into another keyword argument in the plot function, and so what do you get is you get these uh, parameter, uh, so you get on the left-hand side, you have some initial guessing that happens, and then on the right-hand side, you get the fit that you get after you perform it, and in both cases, we get the uh, fitted parameters. Soon, you won't have to guess, I'm working on this, uh, so that it does the, all the guessing for you, and then you can really start automating this process. Um, also, you get uncertainty quantification. Um, these uncertainties are actually terrible because of the nature of the data set that I used, but it, it goes to show that you can actually start taking uh, your experimental data and get uncertainties. And all these, the correlations and the uncertainties were computed with the LMFIT library. Um, also, I just want to do a quick plug for um, like just general computer science. Vectorization is really important. Uh, I started out writing the code unvectorized, but then when I moved to a vectorized algorithm, I saw a jump of an order of magnitude improvement in performance. So it's definitely a good idea when you're thinking about writing uh, scientific code and you have a performance critical part, you should look and see if uh, this is something that you can do to improve your uh, code. So um, finally, on the, on the roadmap, I'm developing a new uh, unified equilibrium routine which will handle all the plotting and point equilibrium and mapping and everything. Um, that ought to get done in the next two weeks. I'm very excited about that. Um, the improved residual functions are on track for point three, which is not this coming release, but the next release. So um, probably before the year's out. Um, also for REST-based interfaces, and then of course um, ever, ever more the uh, bug fixes and performance improvements. So um, thank you, I really appreciate your attention. I also just wanted to do a quick plug. Um, my advisor startup is hiring. If you're interested in this kind of stuff and know MongoDB or REST, um, you should reach out to me. Um, thank you. <laughs>